Welcome to the 14th session of the Fundamental Principles of Communist Production and Distribution Reading Group series. Today we are tackling the first half of Chapter 4, The Control of Operating Life. Who wants to take and do a wee bit of reading? Throw up your hands. Slavic. Chapter 4, The Control of the Operating Life. A. The Beginnings of Workers' Control in the Kerensky Era. The Russian and Hungarian revolutions have also raised the question of production control in practice. If we now take a look at what was meant by production control, it immediately becomes clear that very different things were combined, so that we first have to look at what the meanings behind them were. For the Bolsheviks, apart from the demand for peace, the central point of the program with which they began the revolution was the control of production by the workers. Operational life, which was increasingly disrupted by the war, could not be brought back into normal tracks by Kerensky's social democratic government. The inflation of money had a devastating effect on the purchasing power of the masses. There was a lack of raw materials for various factories, while hoarders and speculators could use the general chaos to make unprecedented profits at the expense of the working people. Under these circumstances, a movement arose among the workers, especially in Petrograd, who did not want to simply surrender to the decisions of the entrepreneurs. The works councils often fought against the dismissal of workers or the closure of factories. In June 1917, they demanded to be able to inspect the books of a company for the first time to ensure that raw materials were leaving the factory not without reason. In October, a metal factory wanted to reduce the size of the factory due to lack of material, at which point the Works Council took the right to inspect the books, while each order had to be signed by the management and also by the representative of the Works Council. In general, it can be said that this movement demanded the right to co-determination in the hiring and firing of workers, in the setting of prices, and in many cases, the involvement of workers in the day-to-day -day management of the factory. Sometimes they also demanded the dismissal of a particularly hated director or certain manager. In short, it can be said that they demanded worker participation. It should be stressed that the trade unions, which were only founded in the course of 1917, did not belong to this movement at all. The demand for worker participation was the result of the energetic initiative, the self-determination of the workers, and such a movement could obviously not be carried out by the trade union officials. On the other hand, however, it should be noted that the struggle was not about the expropriation of the owners, i.e. the abolition of capitalism. The control of the production meant only the control of the capitalists. To illustrate this, we give below statistics on the number of directors and managers who had to be dismissed in 1917 under the pressure of workers. March, 59. April, 5. May, unknown. June, 4. July, 5. August, 17. September, 21. The Menshevik labor minister, Skobolev, of course, could not allow this movement to continue. So he gave the order that works council should not interfere in the management of the factory. That was water on the mills for the Bolsheviks. They used the elementary movement for factory control and their propaganda to organize the works councils in a federal context. The fact that when in revolutionary Petrograd power was taken over, only 30% of the works councils were organized in the union shows how little these works councils coincided with the unions. Later, when the Bolsheviks came to power, the scope of the factory control was established by the November 14th Decree, which established as legal rights the various actions of the workers that were previously considered illegal. We will come back to this later. Okay, so we're kind of setting up the argument, the kind of historical analysis here today about what happened in the Russian experiment in 1917 and the role of the workers' councils versus uh, the unions and the party bureaucracy. Anybody have any comments on this stuff so far? 
it's kind of uh, more historical than anything too theoretical in this section. You're talking about how basically that they demanded worker participation and that was the organic growth that happened at the time, demanding, you know, rights to have control over looking at books, uh, hiring and firing maybe of, well, firing certainly of, of dodgy managers and make sure that production was continuing and speculation and hoarding wasn't happening at a time of great scarcity. There's an interesting one here, a fact here. The fact that when in revolutionary Petrograd power was taken over, only 30% of the workers' councils were organised in the unions show how little these work councils coincided with the unions. So we're going to be juxtapositioning the worker council form versus the union form. It's going to come into a bit more clarity here in sec- as we go on through this part. Um, Slavic, do you want to take the second part then, B? B. The Workers' Control by Marx. It is one of Lenin's great merits that he, before the Bolshevik coup on November 7, 1917, in his pamphlet State and Revolution, clearly pointed out the changes in the ideas of communism that Marx had undergone over the years. In the Manifesto of the Communist Party, 1847, Marx sees the development of communism and ever more far-reaching state capitalism, as we can see it today in Russia. The working class takes over the bourgeoisie's governing apparatus, and in the new governing party parties, will then carry out a radical reform program with the help of this old apparatus. In the Communist Manifesto, the implementation of communism is not the task of the revolutionary masses. The expropriation of the owners is brought about by the new government, which gradually snatches all capital from the bourgeoisie. Land ownership is abolished, but the peasants must, as in the past, raise the ground rent, which is then due to the state. Private capital is still functioning for the time being, but the owners must pay heavy progressive taxes. The National Credit Bank receives a credit monopoly, and the state transport monopoly is also introduced. Then, the state will begin to expropriate more and more companies in order to put them into state operation, while at the same time there must be a rapid increase in the number of national factories, in Russia, the five-year plan. The revolutionary movements of 1848, and in particular the Paris Commune, 1871, strongly criticize this radical reform path. Marx himself, therefore, concluded that the practice of class struggle had shown that these views were wrong for the developed capitalist countries. In 1871 in particular, it became clear that the revolutionary masses not only had to expel the old rulers, but also had to destroy the military bureaucratic state apparatus. Thus, Marx concluded in his civil war in France that the working class cannot take over the state from the bourgeoisie but that it must destroy, smash the state. What is this smashing of the state? The state is not a porcelain vase to be broken. If you want to smash the state, you must neutralize the military bureaucratic caste that rises above the masses like a thousand-headed monster. The Paris Commune did this by introducing full self-government. It did not recognize the civil servants appointed by the central government, but reserved the right to appoint and dismiss all civil servants itself. As a result, they were no longer accountable to the central state authority, but only to those who had delegated them. The revolutionary masses had taken over the legislative and executive power. There was no longer a bureaucratic caste cut off from the masses but the officials themselves had become a living part of the masses. The right of appointment and dismissal by the members of the commune itself placed all officials under the control of the masses. They became the real executive organs of the masses. The commune, in this first place, it filled all posts, administrative, judicial, and educational, by election on the basis of universal suffrage of all concerned, with the right of the same electors to recall their delegate at any time. And, in the second place, all officials, high or low, were paid only the wages received by other workers. 
The general introduction of the principle of accountability downwards is, in reality, nothing more than the fact that the direct management and direction of all social life has passed into the hands of the workers without taking the detour via the state. The general implementation of this principle is also in direct contrast to the state capitalist ideas of nationalization of mature enterprises. From this conception, it is clear that society as a whole is mature for communism and the Marxist way of thinking, and therefore moves as a whole to the new mode of production. The propaganda that the communist parties used to present the gradual takeover of enterprises by the state as a growth towards communism is extremely destructive for the development of the communist orientation of the working class. It does not focus on the awareness that the working class must take direct control of social life, but serves only as a tool to help the communist parties gain power in government. Then, communism is gradually implemented from the governmental authorities under the dictatorship of the communist party. However, in the highly developed capitalist countries, a real proletarian revolution cannot take place along these lines. The implementation of a revolution means the revolutionary energies of the masses are released. And these masses are so numerous, unlike in Russia, that the destructive and constructive forces cannot be kept within the decrees of the government parties. In a real proletarian revolution, a party dictatorship cannot assert itself. A party dictatorship can only be successful if the revolution does not go on if it gets stuck halfway. A party dictatorship only gets a chance as the product of an unfulfilled revolution to which the bourgeoisie joins as a last resort to prevent worse, because a party dictatorship can at best achieve state capitalism, i.e. it allows capitalism to continue, albeit in a modified form. Okay, there is quite a lot of stuff there. Let's see. So he kind of makes the point here that Okay, so here he says, in the, in the manifesto of the Communist Party 1847, Marx sees the development of communism in ever more far-reaching state capitalism as we can see it today in Russia. So he's kind of making the case a bit here that what was implemented in Russia by the Soviets was more akin to Marx of 47 before the Paris Commune. And Marx changed his ideas post the, the Paris Commune. What did they do? in the Paris Commune that Marx was so impressed by. Let's read it here. The Paris Commune did this by introducing full self-government. It did not recognize the civil servants appointed by the central government, but reserved the right to appoint and dismiss all civil servants itself. As a result, they were no longer accountable to the central state authority, but only to those who had delegated them. The revolutionary masses had taken over the legislative and executive power. That would mean that the bureaucracy were not floating above society with different class interests, that they, are, they were directly integrated into society and they were responsible downwards, which was a kind of a radical shift. There was no longer a bureaucratic caste cut off from the masses, but the officials themselves had become a living part of the masses. The right of appointment and dismissal by the members of the commune itself placed all officials under the control of the masses. They became the real executive organs of the masses. Now, this is kind of like not what happened in the Soviet instance. There was certainly the seeds of it. And then they go on here to make the case of a, like a kind of a party dictatorship. In a real proletarian revolution, a party dictatorship cannot assert itself. A party dictatorship can only be successful if the revolution does not go on if it gets stuck halfway. Anybody have any comments on these ideas of smashing the state? Chris? I think they go a little bit too far in this section. Now, I, I'm not saying I agree or disagree one way or another, but I, I, I'm not aware of any instance where Marx or Engels actually repudiates the Communist Manifesto explicitly. E even that section that, you know, uh, I can't remember which one, towards the end, talking about you know nationalization and all that it, it seems like that 
to me, the Paris Commune just never really even got that far. You know, they they didn't take over the banks, and so these transfers went to Tier, which they used to take back Paris. I, I don't know. They're kind of wedging that in here, I think. And uh, I, to me, you could just as easily interpret everything they're describing as taking over the state. But I don't know what anyone else has to say to that. Controversial. Like in the Paris Commune, did they not, like, instead of like ransacking and taking the money from the Bank of Paris, did they not like just write loans for the Paris Commune or something like that? I'm pretty sure something like that happened in there. Slavic. I mean, does anybody remember what it says in State and Revolution? Because that's where he argues Lenin points that out, right? The different the difference between Communist Manifesto and later works. Is did I understand that correctly? I think so. Chris? Yeah, I'm not sure. I'd have to I'd have to have a look. <laughs> I think that's the point they're making here that Lenin was the one that Lenin himself pointed out that there was like a shift in the thinking of Marx and Engels. I think that is not too controversial, but I, I'm not. Yeah, there could have been. I, I, it's just it's it's worth noting that to the ends of their lives, they both held up the Communist Manifesto as as their mo, right? As far as I can tell, uh, I don't know of any text where they repudiate it. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't. Obviously, <laughs> I'm just saying that when they're saying, "Oh, Marx and Engels are, or maybe just Marx changed their ideas," I think they're maybe going a little too far. What about the idea that the revolution that gets halfway party dictatorship takes over? Do people think that's a, a good analysis? Emila's hand up. Just thinking out loud here. I mean, what I'm missing in this overview is the intermediate period between Marx and uh, the Russian Revolution, which is basically the SPD, Second International, Kautsky. And I do know that Kautsky had some views on smashing the state. Uh, there was a recent translation on that by Ben Lewis uh, into English. But the right wing basically was just, well, you can, uh, I suppose, summarize it by radical uh, reformist in the spirit of the Communist Manifesto, I suppose, uh, that is laid, uh, laid out over here. So I'm not entirely of one mind on this. I think there's, there was quite an underlying perhaps struggle in the Second International. I mean, Lenin was, uh, of course, long part of the Second International himself, was a follower of the strategy that Kautsky laid out. But yeah, I'm, I'm not entirely sure about this uh, myself, whether the Second International uh, was itself uh, very explicit on, on smashing the state throughout, or if it was an, uh, more of an um, underlying struggle going on between the left and the right wing of the SPD and other parties in the Second International. Kilcher. He touches on the level of development and the differences there between Paris and, and, and Russia, but he, he doesn't really look at it in detail. And it, it, it's, it's, it's really interesting because he's, I don't fully understand what the point is that he's making about in a real proletarian revolution, a party dictatorship cannot assert itself. And he's, as he's saying that, that if Russia had been more advanced, then the Bolshevik party would not have been able to seize control i.e. it would have been more like France. And it's only because Russia was so backwards that it was able to have this sort of half revolution. Because I have seen that argument made, and I'm wondering if that's his point, or one of his points. I think it's more along the... Like, I don't know, but I, I get the impression it's more along the lines of the proletarians themselves weren't a big enough, organized enough force to dominate the society yeah, that would be my instinct. That's the way I read it, that he does not think that it was like a proper proletarian revolution because the Poles weren't in enough power. They weren't developed maybe theoretically and educationally enough to the point whereby it would be a true proletarian revolution. That's the way I read it. My understanding is that a big factor is just like the large amount of peasantry that you had to deal with. Which is kind of interesting because later on he talks about how, okay, so it wasn't a, a full revolution, but it looks like the Bolsheviks did manage to leverage a lot of the support from workers' councils in order to gain governmental power. But I think from there, you know, if one could possibly have bestowed more power onto the workers' councils and maybe you could have 
essentially completed it, but I think they're pretty, they're somewhat skeptical. I think by the end of the chapter, they're still very much like, okay, there's still like too much of a peasantry to proletariat ratio. Yeah, I think they don't have the they don't have the numbers at that point. Okay, uh, let's move on to section C. I think Alex, you still have your hand up. Do you want to do a bit of reading? Sure thing. C. Worker control among the Bolsheviks. The course of the Russian Revolution practically shows the incompatibility between the Communist Manifesto and the civil war in France, or in other words. The practice has shown that the principles of the Paris Commune, responsibility downwards, i.e. the rule of the working class, are incompatible with state capitalism. The Bolsheviks wanted to unite the two, which proved impossible. They increasingly had to take the leadership of social life out of the hands of the workers to transfer it to the old bourgeoisie and the central government agencies. When the Bolsheviks came to power, they implemented the measures outlined in the Communist Manifesto. Only the banks and the transport sector were to be taken over by the state, while industry was to remain in private hands. As a quote from Lenin, we see a sample of state capitalism in Germany. But if you reflect even slightly on what it would mean if the foundations of such state capitalism were established in Russia, Soviet Russia, everyone who is not out of his senses would have to say that state capitalism would be our salvation. In the CPR, there is the only disagreement about the pace at which this state capitalism is being implemented. The left, led by Radek and Bakarin, is pushing for the immediate transfer of industry to the state, but Lenin can stop this by the end of June. That it was indeed not the intention to expropriate the bourgeoisie is evident from Lenin's pamphlet, The Imminent Catastrophe. This brochure was written a month before the revolution. Here, Lenin addresses the issue of nationalization of banks and says, If nationalization of the banks is so often confused with the confiscation of private property, it is the bourgeois press which has an interest in deceiving the public that is to blame for this widespread confusion. The ownership of the capital wielded by and concentrated in the banks is certified by printed and written certificates called shares, bonds, bills, receipts, etc. Not a single one of these certificates will be invalidated or, or altered if the banks were nationalised, i.e. if all the banks were amalgamated into a single state bank. Whoever owned 15 rubles on a savings account will continue to be the owner of 15 rubles after the nationalisation of the banks. And whoever had 15 million rubles would continue after the nationalisation of the banks to have 15 million rubles in the form of shares, bonds, bills, commercial certificates and so on. The nationalisation of the banks, December 27, 1917, then also took place in this sense, which is shown by the fact that the industry remained in private ownership until the end of June 1918, and the entrepreneurs continued to hold the companies after the nationalisation of the industry with free rental and usage income. According to the Bolsheviks, however, this system would not be ordinary state capitalism as we know it in Western Europe. This system would be operated by the principles of the Paris Commune, by the revolutionary democratic control of company workers. Another quote by Lenin. For control of the industry to be effectively carried out, it must be a workers' control, with a workers' majority in all the leading bodies. And the management must give an account of its actions to all the authoritative workers' organisations. Accordingly, the first decree on workers' control, 14th of November 1917, provided that works councils were entrusted with the control of production, pricing, purchasing of raw materials, and the financial policy of the operational unit. However, they were not allowed to interfere in the daily management of the operation or take their place, while expropriation was prohibited. These provisions applied to both public and private operational units. Considering that in the first decree, a national association of all control committees was immediately decided upon, the entire social life will be under the control of the workers. In the implementation of this decree, the leaders of economic life and the bureaucracy will be responsible downwards. They would not detach themselves from the masses, but would be the executive organs of the workers. Under these circumstances, it would not be the manager of the factory who would be responsible for the production process, but the workers of the factory as a whole. There would be no individual responsibility, but a collective one. In practice, however, nothing has come of this decree. In other words, the cooperation of capital and labour on which it was based could not be introduced. The owners refused to work under this control and sabotage production or close the factories. 
the bourgeoisie and its bureaucracy could not be put under the control of the workers. Quote by Larin and Kritzman. The decree of the Soviet power obliged the entrepreneurs to introduce workers' control in all areas. However, workers' control proved to be a half measure and therefore not feasible. As a slogan, workers' control signified the growing and at the same time still insufficient power of the proletariat. That is, it was an expression of the movement's weakness which has not yet been overcome. The Bolsheviks were thus faced with the choice of either abolishing workers' control or giving the workers the leadership of economic life by abandoning their state capitalist plans. In reality, however, there was no choice. The working class was far too weak, ideological and numerical, to take over the leadership of economic life. There were only 2 million industrial workers with families, most of whom were still on the farm, compared with 120 million peasants, including families. And so the Bolsheviks decided to abolish workers' control. From state capitalism under revolutionary democratic control, only state capitalism remained. Okay, thanks, Alex. Yeah, well, so this idea, there was a kind of, they're making this case that there was an attempt by the Bolsheviks to kind of, you know, make a kind of a, I I don't know, what would you call it? Some kind of a hybrid system whereby you have private property still existing with workers' control. You're trying to, you know, square the circle or circle the square or whatever that phrase is, so that you you have workers in control, but the bourgeoisie still operate and get free rent from the their equipment, or in fact still actually own the factories. So the bourgeoisie basically went on a cap. The capitalists went on a strike. They said, no, we're not. We're not having been told to boss around by these workers. So there was a, you know, a kind of a obviously a crisis in this formation so when it came to the hard choice between what we're going to do we're going to go with the workers in control or are we going to go with a kind of state bureaucracy in control they went for like the state bureaucracy being in control you know a a, a state capitalist uh, in their nomenclature you know and i think they're saying that this could only have been the way given the material conditions as well the ratio of proletarians to peasants and also to the ideological and political development of the proles as well wasn't strong enough either. What do people make of this section? Slavic. Yeah, so I'm I'm wondering why when it says control, like what's to say why couldn't the workers' councils have control over their particular operational unit? Is it talking about control of the entire system or because my understanding is that, okay, you you basically need collective control of your individual unit. And, you know, I, I'm not exactly sure why one couldn't have that component implemented. What what else was missing? Well, I think there's just a direct, con- then there's a direct contradiction between the bourgeoisie controlling uh, operations or the workers controlling it. You know, right, the- right. I, I meant more just like, why would the route of workers control not be feasible like we did talk about like the peasants being too many peasants but why couldn't the workers just control their individual operational unit what what's the issue with with that why is that route not feasible i still don't quite understand what it is about that maybe there wasn't enough workers councils actually you know or maybe the workers councils themselves weren't very functional you know, maybe the workers themselves weren't really skilled in management type stuff. They don't didn't know those processes as well as perhaps pros today might be better at it. I don't know. That's my kind of that's my instinct. I think first is Patrick. Patrick. Yeah. No, I just raised my hand to read, but um, I second that. I mean, it's, it was very early industrialization there. I don't think the management skills were there, and then there was also just the tension with the rural areas in terms of like reliance for food at that same time there was a lot of grain hoarding you know that led to a, to to a lot of food shortages during those years because they couldn't really sell at a at parity okay and uh, i think kilcher then alex and then emil kilcher yeah I, I agree that it's somewhat confused this section it's almost like he's conflating a number of different things that are somewhat orthogonal to each other the, the overwhelming number of peasants doesn't necessarily mean that you, you couldn't have worker-controlled factories. But clearly there was a problem. But 
I, I think it lies elsewhere, and I don't think he's examining it here in, in detail, and that's interesting. He's treating it like an economic problem, but it, it kind of feels like a political one in, in actuality. Like, like the Bolsheviks wanted to control the factories, and it was easier to do so through the through the bourgeoisie than it was through the workers' councils, and that, that feels like more likely to be the real reason that it's they, they rode back so quickly on allowing workers' councils to have control. Yeah, I think it's yeah. I think genuinely that's probably a lot of it. That it's much more easy to control, like you know, a bourgeois Z who owns a factory, than it is to control an unruly mess of workers. Alex, yeah, I, I think I mentioned that when we began this. I, I read some stuff by a, a journalist who was there at the time, who was sympathetic to the revolution. Well, he did say that some of the the workers' councils you know ran the factories very badly. You know, they were. I mean, maybe for good logical reasons, but they were doing stuff like, you know, selling off equipment, for example, maybe because they thought that, you know, they were unlikely to get paid anytime soon. And yeah, the only other point I wanted to make is I think I mean, they are conflating several things. But yeah, I think the point is you know, the workers couldn't take over the whole economic life of the Soviet Union. You know, even if they, they were managed to, able to run their own factories, they couldn't take over the, the whole economy of the Soviet Union, not, not just two million out of commit 120. You know, there's lots of cases, I think, of them, you know, selling the factories off, you know, yeah. the parts and fucking off back to the yeah. to the farm. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'd yeah. buy a few extra acres or buy yeah. a little wood and yeah. have yourself a bit of lumber. Like, and I think that even the fact that that when you have so many people that are essentially part time pros, yeah. you know, the ability to go off and head back head back to the sticks is itself a a, a problem with trying to have mature workers councils. Emil. Yeah, I mean, I, early in the book, there's a link established that the Russians took this idea from basically the Second International, from Kautsky and Hilfiding, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, would this model have worked in better circumstances, like in Germany, where there's the, uh, a developed capitalism, where there's a huge working class, where, it's the, where there is a the biggest Marxist movement uh, in the world at the time, and I think you would have run into basically the same issues in a very short uh, time span for basically the same reasons. And in that case, I, I think it is also telling that before the Civil War and before shit hit the fan, this decree of the 14th of November, a week after the takeover of power, there's this decree of basically banning uh, workers' control and transferring power to the state. I think that is quite uh, uh, telling. And to make it a bit more current state, I think that this is basically still a life issue for the left right now. So what if the working class takes power? What do we actually do with that power? Do we also have government bureaucrats in the name of the Communist Party taking over power? Do we actually have workers' control? Well, what does it mean to take power? What does it mean to have workers' control? So this, this question is, isn't really resolved quite yet if at all well was the idea of workers actually controlling the factories a big element of the socialism at the time you know was it a main plank of the uh, the bolsheviks or the socialist revolutionaries at the time slavic uh, my understanding is that at least for concerning the support by the bolsheviks it, i guess they used the term all power to the soviets which I, I don't know to what extent there's an overlap between Soviets and councils. The the other point, I, I guess, is like there's a critique here of like expropriations as a matter of individual rather than the collective community, because if the expropriations are done as a community, it shouldn't be then just sold off. But it also does raise some concerns because part of the impetus of a revolutionary workers' movement is that, you know, the workers' self-interest will be the driving force. And if the self-interest is to just sell off parts of the factory so they can go escape into the countryside, that presents a problem for that argument. Like, I think I heard an interview on maybe, I think it might have been Sean's Russia blog, uh, excellent podcast about, uh, I think it was with Lars Lee talking about that all power to the Soviets phrase. And he was making the case that that all power to the Soviets phrase was used when there was like a dysfunctional government and also at the same time a workers' council movement. 
and Lenin was making the case that the power has to be somewhere. It should be in the it should be in the Soviets as opposed to that decrepit, dying parliamentary regime. I don't know, like whether that's Lenin saying I'm a cancel communist. I think that's a bit of a stretch. But I think that that made quite a lot of sense to me at the time. I don't know if people have read any of that largely, or I haven't. I've just uh, listened to a couple of interviews, but I found I found that quite edifying. So this is Chris is saying from uh, the April theses number eight. It is not our immediate task to introduce socialism, but only to bring social production and distribution of products at once under the control of the Soviet of workers' deputies. So, like we were talking, like in in the, all this, like this is the great argument, isn't it, between Leninists and like left calm type people? Is like was Lenin and the Bolsheviks just being cynical here and uh, making a move towards Paris and Soviets to destroy the parliamentary body and then come back in and take control themselves, or was it a problem with implementing that, or was it somewhere halfway between the two? So, I, I think we're we're probably not going to get there. But for today, like if you ask me. Today, like we, I don't think we have this problem in developed capitalist economies of people thinking, "Oh, I'll sell up, you know, a part of that thing, and I'll and I'll head back to the folks in the sticks," because the folks aren't in the sticks; they live in the cities. So I think that's a, a a fundamental difference to the situation that's here. And also, I think that the level of skills of the pros is way above probably what it was then. You know, uh, I, I fundamentally believe that. I think most of the skills of management is to do with finance and uh, like, you know, HR and trying to extract <laughs> maximum exploitation of uh, labor effort. So I, I think that the, the scene is a lot more, although we, we don't have a revolutionary movement, I think the conditions for being able to implement a council-based system, a Soviet-based system, you know, I think it's much better conditions than what was there at the, at the Russians at the time. Emil wants to speak. Yeah, just to counter a bit, to, to push back a bit on that. I mean, the, the whole dynamic is that basically the, the developed West, like Western Europe, is very much integrated in the world economy. And having a, for example, uh, I'm from the Netherlands, so uh, having a, a socialist rev revolution, workers taking power in the Netherlands and having a socialist state in the Netherlands is a ludicrous idea for very obvious reasons <laughs> we would be bankrupt basically in a week or so because of capitalism being a global system and and the netherlands being dependent for its economy for like 60 percent or 70 percent for international trade so well it's, that, it's not that's a, like that's uh, like the the mike mcnair argument isn't it that it has to be at least continental level true yeah. you know it's, it's a different it's a different kind of piece to that complex puzzle but uh yeah absolutely you know Imagine like uh, Netherlands, they wouldn't, yeah, they wouldn't last a week, you know, 60% is probably a minimum, like as in the, that 60% will prevent the other 40% even being able to operate, <laughs> if we're honest with uh, like the complex IT systems and everything, you know, you'd just be, you'd be completely screwed. Let's move it on. Who wants to read section D? Any hands up? Patrick. D, the destruction of workers' control by the Bolsheviks. Let us now proceed to show briefly the disempowerment of the working class by the Bolsheviks. To do this, we must focus on the relationship between the workers' councils and the trade union movement. During the Kerensky period, there were two organizations of industrial workers side by side, the trade unions and the workers' councils. The workers' councils were direct representatives of the workers in the factories they themselves were also in the factory. The workers' councils were the real weapon of direct action. A revolutionary corps of workers from the factory called the entire workforce together for a general meeting, and the position on various issues were determined. The question was not, which party or union do you belong to? It was completely indifferent. As an operational unit, the decisions were made, the class unit, went beyond the fragmented spirit of the membership cards. The actions of the masses were thus taken out of the framework of the leadership policies of the various parties and unions and turned into class politics. Of course, the trade unions and the social democrats were fierce opponents of the workers' councils. 
Only the Bolsheviks immediately supported them and organized them in a national context because this lively activity of the masses would play an important role in the struggle for power for the, for the Bolsheviks. However, this only lasted until the masses had helped the Bolsheviks gain governmental power. They then strangled the workers' councils and, and went over to the trade union in front. As early as December 22, 1917, the uh, Bolsheviks abolished workers' councils on the Murmansk Railroad, and a director appointed by the People's Commissary of Transportation took its place. This was the sign for the further course of the revolution. The Bolsheviks now set out to lead the revolution in an orderly way, and in order to enforce their leadership policy, it was above all importance to get rid of the unpleasant workers' councils. They did this in the same way as the German social democracy and the trade union movement would do a year later in Germany. They took them into, into the cen central apparatus of the trade union movement. It was a painful but short operation. In January 1918, when the Bolsheviks were in power for two months, they organized a joint Congress of trade unions and the works councils in order to achieve cooperation be between the often opposing movements because the Bolsheviks believed that the trade unions together with the Supreme Economic Council should take over the management of operational life. The trade unions had to be transformed into industrial unions on the one hand, and the works councils had to follow the central leadership on the other. The company organizations were to be called the lowest cells of the industrial federations. This was the decision. However, this only happened after fierce resistance from the workers' councils. This was perfectly understandable. For every independent movement, the very principle of life of the councils had been abandoned. All funds were placed in the hands of the central administrations. All independent funds in the factories, strike funds, support funds were banned, which considerably restricted the workers' councils' own movement. In the opinion of the Bolsheviks, this self-movement was completely superfluous since at the following trade union congress, April 20, 1918, where they had the majority, they passed the following resolution. Conflicts between workers and management must be immediately submitted to the central administration, the Federation of Trade Unions, for decision. If the workers refuse to submit to the decisions of the trade union bodies, they must be immediately expelled from the new union and bear all the consequences resulting from it. A second consequence of the joint meeting of unions and work councils January 1918 was the enormous growth of the trade union movement. In addition to the inclusion of works councils, most of which were not unionized, a practically compulsory membership was now introduced, albeit not legally, a works meeting was called by the party cells of an operational unit at which it was proposed to join the union jointly, which was then decided by, by a show of hands. The operational unit had thus joined the union. All newly re recruited workers would automatically be registered as members. With the contribution deducted from their wages, the uh, growth of the trade union movement was therefore by no means the uh, growth of the workers' class consciousness but the membership of the trade union had become an official obligation. The workers accepted the withholding of contributions as an order from above, completely independent of their will. However, third and most important consequence of the joint meeting of unions and work councils in January 1918 was of a very different nature. Only the workers' organizations recognized by the Central Council of Trade Unions were permitted by law. Since membership of the official trade union was an official obligation, this meant nothing more or less than the working class was deprived of the right to organize. One was allowed, no one had to be a member of, of that, of the ally of the government party. In reality, the working class was not, and still is, to be allowed to organize to defend its interests. Okay. So big, big section there. Thanks for reading that there, Patrick. The It didn't take long for the Bolsheviks to turn around and try and strangle the, the Soviets. You know, people who have all different manner of opinions on 
what was the reasoning, blah, 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 which to me is not particularly the issue. It's just like a kind of historical thing. It does remind me, though, of I don't know if anybody has seen The Wire. And uh, in The Wire, there was this like kind of a special unit for tracking like drugs and they were starting to get some traction. And they send in a guy to basically a, a new manager guy to come in and wreck the organization and just basically get them to do like petty uh, lifting guys off street corners instead of going for the kingpins. And it, it completely destroyed the kind of morale of the unit and quickly it, it led it to be shut down. It, it does remind me of that. Like I had exactly the same experience when I was working in a department in a bank in, in Ireland where they got a, a guy in and within 18 months, he didn't fire anybody, but the entire department left. It, it, it's a, it is an interesting tactic. But like we do see here, the, the evidence here is fairly plain that the, the workers' councils uh, were basically put out of commission pretty quickly after the Soviets came to power. And they implemented a trade union type form of socialism, whereby they would have bargaining for a wage. So when, when you have that trade union in there, that's a function. Like the trade unions are a function of bargaining for wages. So it, it shows that you still had this wage relation. That's the kind of key point we need to take away from this. There was somebody asked in the in the chat there, I think it was was Slavic was asking about how they how they basically put the councils under the control of the unions. This is the quote here. They did this in the same way as the German social democracy and the trade union movement would do a, a year later in Germany. They took them into the central apparatus of the trade union movement. And I think what's happened there is in the post 1919 uh, situation with SPD, where the government to kind of destroy the power of the councils in Germany, they brought them into the apparatus of the trade union movement to kill them. I, I think that's what happened in the post 1919 situation. Slavic. I, I know we're focusing on the economic and theory here, but it, it is quite uh, concerning that, you know, we talked about how the material conditions in Germany were more, I guess, I, ideal, like the workers' councils maybe did have more of a chance in Germany because of the greater number of industrial proletariat. And then here we see a party doing a similar move as the Russians did. So... I mean, I'd have to study the kind of 1919 time of uh, Germany, but it is pretty concerning that here we have more ideal material conditions, but essentially the same action taking place. Yeah, what I would say as well, though, is that like you had a like to me, it very much seems to map on to the left and the right wings of this social democratic party that the right wing of the party wanted to have the trade union and keep the wage form. And the left wing onto the party wanted to have workers' control. Whether they knew they wanted to abolish the wage form or not, I'm not so sure. But that that split that here is happening in, in Russia, that split was in Germany too. And it's not like that the councils were that dominant. They were definitely a force in German society, but they were far from being, say, like the the mission of like German social democracy. I think, you know, it would only be a, a wing and probably the smaller wing, I think, if we were to look at the sizes of the left versus the right and center of that party. Emil? Yes, just to, to add on that, because I made some remarks about this as well. I mean, it's not as simple as saying there was a split within the left and the right wing within social democracy at this uh, point in time, because here we have Lenin writing on state and revolution, saying we have to smash the state et cetera, et cetera, and then basically doing this course of action just less than a year later. So there's, there's a bit more complicated paradox going on here, and I'm, I'm not quite sure where to put my finger on it uh, just yet. Okay, but I think it is fair to say that the, the left of the socialist movement were the council, were more the workers' control than the right of the socialist movement were more bourgeois representative route to through the state to communism i think that's a fair statement and i think we see the same actual contradiction within the movements working its way out in both cases it wasn't like a united radical social democracy thing to have workers in control workers councils i, I don't think 
it's fair to say that even if people polemically use that point, I don't think it's fair to say that the parties were set up in, in, in that fashion. Again, the old history stuff of, of, of the ins and outs of this is is not my strength not my strength to be honest. So I don't want to come down too hard on either side. But I think theoretically we can take a lot of lessons. It's the way I, I like to look at it. Okay, well we hit the final section then. Chris. All right, I'll read E here. The right to appoint and dismiss the members of the commune themselves placed all the officials under the control of the masses. They became the real executive organs of the masses. Marx, Civil War in France, page 40. Since the working class was deprived of the right to organize already in the first period of the revolution, the ruling party would represent its interests. It is obvious that also the management of production by the workers, the responsibility downwards of all officials, had to look sad. This is indeed the case. We have already pointed out the contradiction between the Supreme Economic Council and the factory organizations. For example, how the Jivilov or Yivilov starch factory was nationalized. But the Works Council refused to hand over the factory to a representative of the Supreme Economic Council. The SEC introduced a system of inspectors to bring the Petrograd metal companies under its control. But serious conflicts arose between the inspectors and the works councils. It is also no coincidence that the Union of Workers' Representatives, which defended the autonomy of the worker, works councils, was created in the railway workshops because this is where the disempowerment of the workers' councils, Murmansk Railway, first began. However, the real struggle was fought out at the already mentioned Trade Union Congress of 20th of April, 1918. The Bolsheviks proposed to abolish accountability downwards by proposing that the individual responsibility of the director be implemented from now on. This was decided. The director was thus no longer accountable to the workers of the factory, but to the higher authorities, a responsibility which, of course, is only possible if he runs the factory individually without the workers. The workers were thus ousted from the management of the company, and workers' control was reduced to checking that the director was complying with the labor law and collective agreements with the trade unions, which is the function of the Statutory Works Council in Germany. After the introduction of the new economic policy in March 1921, the trade unions were also ousted from production management, which in name was transferred to the Supreme Economic Council, but in reality to the czarist bourgeoisie and its specialists. That this situation still exists today, obviously this is from the 30s, is shown by the so-called Ramsin trial of 1930. All phrases about the dictatorship of the proletariat in Russia cannot hide the fact that the old bourgeoisie is responsible for production. These red directors are, of course, not responsible to the workers because they are not appointed by them. In this context, we recall the resolution we published earlier, which was passed by the Central Committee of the CPR on September 7, 1929. Measures aimed at reorganizing the management of production and defining the dictatorial rights of factory management. Under the aspect of the smashing of the state, the destruction of the old bureaucracy, the subjugation of all officials to control of the masses, the Russian Revolution is thus moving further and further away from communism. The separation of the masses from the management of production has become a fact. And thus, the old situation of bureaucratic rule has been restored in a new form. The Bolsheviks ultimately had to bow to the backwardness of the social structures in the agrarian country of Russia. They were forced to smash the proletarian elements present in the Russian Revolution 
and take over the old bureaucratic apparatus. Quote here, we took over the old machinery of state. That was our misfortune. Very often the machinery operates against us. In 1917, after we seized power, the government officials sabotaged us. This frightened us very much and we pleaded, please come back. They all came back, but that was our misfortune, Lenin. Yeah, that's a really great quote at the end. And like one thing that's kind of seems to be absent from a lot of this talk to me is maybe geopolitical pressures. I wonder, you know, how much geopolitical pressure is put on to like revolutionary movements like this to conform to like a not proletarian <laughs> control thing to keep elements of like power structures that are similar to capitalist power structures in formations throughout the society. It seems to me that there would likely be geopolitical pressure playing into this as well. It's something that's reasonably absent from the analysis of the book. I find that kind of interesting. Uh, Emil. Well, this was what the Civil War was about. This was what the uh, 20 or whatever it was uh, invading armies uh, <laughs> was, was basically all about to put on that uh, that kind of pressure to restore order, capitalist order. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but it, it's theoretically not mentioned in the book, hardly. Is the Civil War mentioned in the book? Uh, some in passing, Once, yeah. maybe yeah. once, you know. And I think it's, uh, you know, these are, the, these are the ways, you know, this is capitalism for you, isn't it? But it's, just, it's just interesting. Um, Chris? Yeah, that's a important lacuna in the book is, I mean, the context of, of a catastrophic war, right? It, it's really something you, that can't be overlooked. I mean, in 1918, they, they had the Germans taking over what half of the country, like all of the Ukraine. And it, th th this was a completely catastrophic situation. And I don't know if the Bolsheviks made many good decisions in the long run. Uh, they did what they had to do to survive, whether or not it was worth uh, surviving is another question but i haven't really made up my mind on what to think of the russian revolution myself so it, it's just a really difficult period and fortunately a lot of those conditions no longer exist but yeah give it 20 years give it 20 yeah. years the failing crops <laughs> Fuck. yeah well you know uh, i think if workers uh, the cynical side of me thinks instead of going back to the farm like they would, you know, sell the uh, factory, split the money, and buy uh, Chevy Silverados and drive off somewhere. And I don't know. Buy Bitcoin. Bitcoin. Yeah, baby. buy Bitcoin with it. Oh, yeah, that's what they would do. Yeah, they would get Bitcoins and um, NFTs, Pet Rock and, and NFTs. Yeah, they could buy the NFT for this book, The Fundamental Principles of Communist Production. That's what yeah. they do. I'm going to sell the NFTs to this reading group series. I'll make millions, I tell you. Millions. No, it's kind of depressing when you when when you read this kind of stuff and you just see how the 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 revolutionary working class was fundamentally put back in the bottle so early on, you know, by what it, what is it here? By 1921, the new economic policy, the trade unions themselves were ousted for production management, which in in name was transferred to the Supreme Economic Council, but in reality to the Tsarist bourgeoisie and its specialists. So we had the workers' councils alive and a revolutionary action in the factories with all its problems or whatever and that was taken over by the the maneuvered by the by the bolsheviks to put that control into uh, the workers councils under the control of the trade unions and then the trade unions themselves were sidelined so in a space of four years it had been completely uh, reoriented back into top-down economic system whereby we have like Ex bourgeoisie and Sarah specialists, and the revolutionary power has probably been completely dissipated. Like I, I do like there was a there, there was like some comment earlier in an earlier section where he was kind of talking about like the actual you know the unleashing of the of the power of the revolutionary uh, workers, like and how that revolutionary power was basically reined in and then like kind of the life squeezed out of it by the end. But I think you see the same dynamic. Um, is that I think reading the is it George Orwell's one about the homage to Catalonia, and you see that same process again that the 
you know, people really like the revolutionary period, uh, you know, barring all the crap and the horror of it, but the, 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 the freedom and the sense of worker actual self-determination is a, is a major thing for people. And once you, you, you dampen that, it's like, you know, you, you've killed the, the, the revolution, the, the, the child in the, in the basket or whatever that expression is. I don't know what I'm talking about. Kilcha. I was just wondering, get the impression from, from reading here that even at the time people talked about this as a, uh, Lenin and the like talks about this as a, as a transitionary period of, and I'm hesitant to use the word state capitalism because we, we keep saying that's that's not necessarily correct, but where the, the Russia wasn't yet ready to have a, a full communist revolution. At what point did that that morph through, through propaganda or whatever to being, to, or not be just not being talked about at all into this being the, what they had, their setup, they had been the desirable form of, of, of government because obviously they didn't do the work that this 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 chapter asks for of educating the proletariat further. So something went wrong and they either talked about it or they tried to cover it up. And it's it's uh, it's interesting. Well, they did constantly talk about the idea of, uh, you know, they never said they were communists like they were under communism. It was like they were under socialism and they were trying to get to communism like they would openly talk about stuff like that. You know, Khrushchev and stuff like that. I remember reading some stuff. You know, ah, so I didn't. I didn't even realize that. So that's uh, that's that's that shows how victimized by propaganda, our own Western propaganda, I've been. Yeah, like so. They, like I think, like at no stage have they ever claimed they were in communism. But like you know, like what are you going to do when you have a system that's basically based on uh, exploitation, uh, like capitalism is, where the workers aren't getting the full the value of the product that they produce. So you have a system that's based on exploitation, and it's very. It's very difficult for them to transition to a communist phase that is based on something like the labor time planning because they have to just they have to kind of like talk about uh, what is the current state of affairs and you know ideologically that's very very difficult to do. Emil and then Slavic. Yeah, I remember reading a text a while back and I forgot the title of it, but basically the argument was that in the fifties. They started uh, experimenting with uh, cybernetics in the, in the economy. And they, when the proposals were made to the Central Committee, they apparently quickly realized that this would be quite undermining for their position of power. So they click, quickly just buried that, the whole concept. Uh, and it, it never took off the ground. Yeah, and I think that was even more like, you know, communism based upon a kind of limitless supply as well. It wasn't about sharing the, the actual power you know, the power would be diminished by the bureaucrats in that kind of a situation. But like, it was more of a technical implementation of like delivery of stuff based on need, I think, as far as I know. So it wasn't like now, like, now we're going to have our democratic form. You know, I think right up until the fall of the Soviet Union, I think propagandic wise internally, they would have said that it was democratic as far as I hear from all the Stalinists. Uh, not that, that's me. Slavic, yeah. I was looking at my name. I was thinking, <laughs> <laughs> Tom, you want to speak? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Tom. Um, yeah, I, my understanding was uh, between the socialists and communists as like Lenin creating a distinction between like socialism as, as basically developing the productive capacities of Russia and then being able to move into communism eventually. So I believe they did call themselves socialists at least. But I guess back to like the political point is like, what exactly did the Bolsheviks have to offer over the Kerensky government? Because my understanding is like part of what propelled them was like, as you said, the the water to the mills, whatever, um, was the works workers' councils. And on top of that, also the war. So as I see it, like what the Bolsheviks basically had to offer at the time was to end the war, uh, support the workers' councils, but ultimately it sounds like their goal was to develop the means of production further rather than actually, right, to give workers control and to move into communism. It was, a, yeah, kind of a, a, a strange bourgeois revolution, really, in essence. Uh, Chris? Right. Yeah, I just wanted to say just... To to provoke like one person I know who would probably agree with a lot of the stuff in this chapter would be uh, uh, Stalin, right? He, he hated the specialists. 
<laughs> so, <laughs> he, he, he wanted, this he going? wanted to kill them all. Where is this going? <laughs> no, no, no. I, I just, yeah. But that, that, drop. that's kind of the irony here. <laughs> but uh, but I, I don't know if there's some some dark hidden, hidden uh, meaning to that, but let's hope not. <laughs> <laughs>